This is episode number 147 of the Guns Magazine podcast. Hi there, and welcome to the Guns Magazine podcast, one of the shooting world's most listened to gun talk programs. I'm your host and the editor of Guns Magazine, Brent Wheat. Thanks for joining us as we talk to the interesting folks who make up the world of shooting, hunting, law enforcement, and the firearms industry. First, before we get started, I'd like to ask you to take a second and subscribe to the podcast while I share a few words about our sponsor, 1791 Gun Leather. Centuries ago, the original patriots of this country fought and died for the promises they protected in the Constitution. Chief among those promises was the right to bear arms. Now, generations later, 1791 protects that right and our firearms. Makers of the 2020 Holster of the Year, every 1791 holster is a mastery of craft and function, customizable to any firearm you require. 1791 Gun Leather provides quality and service in the way only an American company can. Please visit 1791gunleather.com for more information. In today's episode, we talk to Jim Shepard, the publisher of The Outdoor Wire and an RV owner. Jim bought his land yacht during the pandemic, primarily for business travel, and he's learned a lot of lessons the hard way during the last two years. If you're considering buying an RV for hunting competition or just touring our great nation, you need to hear the good, the bad, and the ugly from this week's guest, Jim Shepard. Well, good morning, Jim. Good morning. I appreciate you taking the time. You are one of the busiest guys I know. You're the publisher of The Outdoor Wire. You are one of the founders of CNN. You don't work there anymore, thank goodness. And most importantly for our, our discussion today, you're a very active outdoors person, and, and you're a shooter, and you are a, probably one of the leading gadabouts in our industry, both in terms of, of reach and influence and your opinions. You, I always like talking to you because you just tell how you feel. I, I'm sure that will happen again today, right? You know, I'm trying to do better, but I would bet against me <laughs> not coming out unfiltered before something was done. Now, hopefully I can keep the, the wordy dirds out of it. We won't get in trouble, you know. Well, we do have the beeper, so we can we can fix that. But for today's purposes, now, generally we talk about guns. It's the Guns Magazine podcast, but this is yeah. kind of a, a a little bit of a departure for us. It's not strictly gun related, but yet it absolutely is because our audience really uh, likes RV travel. They have a lot of RVs, and you bought one, uh, I believe, two years ago during the yeah. infamous pandemic. So that uh, you and I both travel to a lot of media events, and you just decided rather than getting on that crowded germ tube up in the sky, you'd start driving. So. You have yeah. written about that several times, and uh, I thought, let's let's just talk about that, because I, I have been in the same boat now that the pandemic's over. I thought, you know, maybe it is time to buy an RV and, and enjoy that life, and, and you've pretty much convinced me maybe I don't want to do that. I've already got a boat, so. Well, I don't think that's quite fair. I'd love to sell you my <laughs> RV so you could get out and experience it for yourself. I didn't make you a deal. But uh, yeah, two years, two years ago, I decided, you know what? I'm just going to hit the road. And I've done it before. You know, I put the Jeep and the camper together about 10 years ago and, and did a what I called my time to stand tour mm -hmm. and went around the country telling people that, you know, you can make a difference in in life. You can make a difference in politics. You can make a difference in other people's lives. And you only got to do three real simple things. Stand up show up and speak up, get up off your butt on the sofa, quit complaining about stuff, go to the city council meeting, tell them how you feel respectfully. Yeah. You don't want to get dragged out in handcuffs. It happens. <laughs> it happens a lot more now than it used to because you made me feel threatened. Yes. But anyway, um, you know, that, that did very well. And it opened my eyes to the fact that our parents and our grandparents had a great idea because when they came back from World War II, they took the wing tanks off the bombers and all the other things and turned them into little teardrop campers, which I had in my first trip, and traveled the country. You know, we don't get a sense of what's really out there when we climb on the stainless steel tube full of germs and people we don't like and go to 
you know, go one way to the other and don't stop in the middle. Yep. Um, so it, it kind of opened my eyes to it. And when the pandemic hit, I just decided, OK, I'm going to bite the bullet, take the rapid depreciation on my taxes for a business <laughs> expense and buy an RV. And and we did. And I made a big trip with I made several little trips to familiarize myself with it. Then I made a big trip where I went from our house outside Nashville all the way to Rapid City, South Dakota, all alone. It was awesome. It was a great trip. I learned a lot that I didn't know. I, I also learned that, you know, average mileage ain't. And uh, and but I learned that it's a it's a community out there. The communitas feeling of the people who RV is amazing. And I would go to a campground and be doing what I call the the RV full of buzzard gas. <laughs> if I couldn't pull in and pull out. I'd have to circle before I could land like a buzzer. <laughs> and and uh, they would come out and go, no, 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 no. Let me show you how to do that. And they'd jump in and park it for me. Oh, wow. And then, you know, you learn all kinds of stuff that way. Or they'd see you fumbling around about to blow yourself up with a primer stove. And mm. they'd go, no, 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 don't do that. And did you change the jets on your, on your gas stove before you hooked it to the bottle on your RV? And I'm like, no. And they said, well, don't turn it on. Because uh, it'll be eye opening and <laughs> hair singeing and, and, you know, but it was great fun. And I realized what a great community of people. So since then, we've joined, you know, um, uh, all these camping organizations, not KOA and all the normal ones you think of, but the hip camps and all of these places where you can go stay in wineries. And, and it's great fun. And we've done what they call boondocking, where you go without a, you know, a essentially a hookup for your hotel room yeah. and you go all self-contained and it's it's been a learning experience but yeah it's like anything else like your boat you're going to learn whether you want to learn or not you're going to learn and and it's a lot to learn yep well you know it, you've described the part that that everybody really likes and that's what we all think of especially before you sign on that <laughs> dotted line that you know it is wonderful I've, I've spent a lot of time in, in friends campers i got a friend uh we just went on a trip not too long ago on a salmon fishing trip that <laughs> after a four-day weekend we caught exactly nothing but it he did make up for it his uh he's got a fifth wheel but it's got a fireplace and big screen tv and the whole shoot match it it makes uh, tough days on the water you know much easier Year, but there's the other side of it, and that's really what I wanted to talk about. Is you've discovered that an RV is a makes travel a carefree experience, completely devoid of headaches until you got to repair <laughs> repair this yeah. thing. So <laughs> mileage may vary, slightly higher prices in some yeah. areas. Tax, tag, title, and dealer preparation charges not included. <laughs> yeah, there's a whole lot of stuff they don't tell you, and your orientation of to your new RV that you paid six figures for sometimes you can pay seven if you mm -hmm. get crazy um it consists of okay this is your rv you hook it right here um the 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 brown water is this button the <laughs> non-brown water is that button don't <laughs> confuse them yeah uh, by the way there's a backup horn so don't be worried when it goes <clears throat> <clears throat> like a titan two missile silo opening <laughs> and uh and good luck yeah. And I'm like, what? wait, wait a minute here. I've <laughs> got, in essence, a house on wheels. Yeah. And to understand how complicated it is, you need to understand it's a house on wheels with two or three different ways to power itself, to heat itself, to cool itself, to cook. To, you know, to do anything you want to flush the toila. There's two or three different ways to do all of these things. And if you screw them up, there's always a consequence. Sometimes a very ugly consequence, <laughs> oh, especially invo they, involving the toilet. The toilet is a uh, in his experience. Thank God they don't flush up. That's a Jerry <laughs> Lewis movie. It does not work that way. Now, they can back up, which is worse than a Jerry Lewis movie. But, I, you know, there are several things involved in it. You need to understand, like with electricity, you have shore power, you have generator power, and then you have solar power. I have all three on mine. 
What you need to understand is shore power and generators don't play well together, and none of neither of them like <laughs> solar. And the other thing you need to learn is, you know, the solar-powered RV? Yeah, if you want just a little bit of light, you're fine. You want air conditioning? Mm, not so much. Yeah. You want fans? You want, oh, wait, you want everything? Sorry, can't do that. You've got to have more power than that. Turn on the generator. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Well, I do now. <laughs> I've learned a lot about it. And I've also learned the number one thing that you don't think about when you get an RV, especially if you get a, 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 a motor home, once I get in, I drop my peers at auto levels and it does all those wonderful things. And I hook up the, the good water and the bad water and the power and I hook up the, the cable TV and I got everything working and running and I decide I need a quart of milk. <laughs> How am I going? Yeah. The tow along is always an issue. Now, when I went to South Dakota, I towed my motorcycle. Ah. Which was, you know, which was great, except then I had to unbuckle, unbelt, unstrap, unfasten, and get off the trailer a motorcycle every time I wanted to go get a quart of milk. I don't like milk that well. <laughs> so I just did without milk. I drank some black coffee yeah. until I could get to the McDonald's. By the way, they don't go through a drive through <laughs> ever. They just don't fit. Right. Now, if you park right outside the drive through They'll actually let you walk to the window and make an order because they don't want you to tear the signage down. Yeah. So they'll make an exception. But, you know, it, there are a lot of fun things to learn. The thing you have to learn about it is you can't get all torqued up about it. It doesn't mm -hmm. do that. It does not care how angry you get. <laughs> and if you kick it, you feel it. It doesn't. We were traveling on a holiday weekend much like the one coming up here. And we pull into the campground. We're all set up. We backed in. We're hooked up. We're all happy. We pull out our chairs. We're sitting there. And the guy rides by on his little cart to make sure we're hooked up. He says, you know, you got a flat tire, right? Oh. And I'm like, uh, no. He said, well, you do. And I look, and he's right. I wow. did. And I'm like, uh-oh. I don't know how to change a tire on an RV. It's a yeah. good thing because I don't have a spare. Are you going to jack a four-ton vehicle up? <laughs> no, not with my little bottle jack. You're not. So I I asked him, what do I do? And he said, well, there's only one, you know, one place around and do this and that. And it's 4.30 on a Friday afternoon of a holiday weekend. I got a flat tire. Yeah. I call this place and they're like, mm, can't help you. We're done. Now there's this guy. So you get to get into the chain of phone calls. Yeah. It's, it's like the whisper campaign. When you were a kid, you sat in a circle and you whispered something to somebody. Well, by the time I got to the right guy, it was 530 on Friday afternoon. He said, well, you know, I'm off and I'm taking the family camp. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm like, well, I got an RV. If you bring your record, we'll trade. Yeah. And they laughed. He said, I'll fix it. He showed up 15 minutes hits the ground like NASCAR with this completely <laughs> equipped mobile unit, pulls an air jack out, fires up a, a compressor on his truck, jacks my whole unit up <laughs> like NASCAR, pulls the wheel, fixes the tire, puts it back. And he said, oh, you just had a broken valve stem. No big deal. Oh. Pops it off, puts it back, pumps it up, puts it back. Fifteen, Literally 15 minutes. Best one hundred and fifty five dollars. Wow. One hundred and fifty five bucks. But if he hadn't been willing to come and do that, <laughs> my wife would have had to have taken her car and gone back to work because the RV service people weren't coming back till Tuesday. Wow. So, yeah, you know, you need to be prepared for that. Yes, there's going to be unexpected things. I moved mine the other day. And I'm like, where's all that water coming from? Oh, no. Well, it's it's coming from a teeny little hole in the roof that didn't get completely sealed and has opened up over time. So water comes in. No big deal. I go to the RV place. They fix it. The other thing you need to know, if you buy an RV, um, the people who do the RV repairs don't do the chassis. 
They don't do the engine because that came from, in our case, came from Mercedes. You got to go to Mercedes to get an oil change to get it. And so now my RV, when I go over and check it, beeps at me 64 days since service (laughs) due. I'm like, I haven't moved you in eight months. You don't need service. You need round tires. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. But, you know, it's, it's a learning experience. And, and it's great fun. And it's great. You, you can make, you know, you can always make light of it afterwards. It's not funny <laughs> at the time, but it is funny later. This is like, true. I make all of the trip to South Dakota, 3,000 miles I drive, six miles from home, my windshield gets cracked by a rock. Oh, geez. <laughs> so now I have a, an expensive really nice RV with a cracked windshield because I'm not getting into that drama yet. I'm going to call the glass doctor and see if he can fix my pains, you know, or whoever those people are that drill and glue and vacuum suck your windshield. So it'll be all fixed up. But it's like anything else. You know, it's like I've got a gun and it's absolutely flawless. It never misses. It never misfires. It never has to be cleaned. Say what? (laughs) <laughs> you know, well, of course, it, it's the definition of experience. Yeah. It's what you get when you think you're getting something else. Well, you know, I've been following your adventures and, and routine maintenance sounds like one of those things that maybe we should have foreseen ahead of time. But that turns into one of those. Uh, what? Huh? How much kind of thing? So, and, and, well, even more than that, it turns into how much and when? Yeah. I mean, I had a part fail. I, well, my my hot water heater froze and the fitting popped because I, stupid. It was, I guess, it was my fault. I don't know. Part broke and I couldn't. And I called and I said, I need to get it fixed. And they said, well, we'll order the part and we can see you in 11 weeks. Oh, my goodness. And I'm like, huh? He said, that's as soon as we can see it. I said, what do you mean 11 weeks? Well, one thing the pandemic did was back up service and back up parts and back up manufacturing. And it came to a dead stop. And, as, and if you've been reading some of my, my misadventures, my first experience with the RV Industry Association was after I tarred and feathered the entire <laughs> industry for lousy service and terrible parts, they called and said, well, what can we do to help? And I'm like, well, I don't know. It's a little late to the party to help. And they're like, well, you know, you need to understand. And I learned that, as Mike Rowe says, there is a terrible shortage of qualified maintenance people. Mm -hmm. And you can make in the RV industry, just like the car industry, as a service technician, 100K easy. Wow. Easy. You don't have to go out in the field and crawl under leaky toilets and stuff. They'll bring them to you (laughs) and pay you to fix it. And people don't want to work. Wow. Consequently, you can't get service done. So I wound up, the RVIA is in Elkhart, Indiana. So I wound up jumping in my RV, calling the, the people who made it. They tell me, well, we've got repair facilities right here. I said, I'll be there tomorrow. <laughs> and I drove all day, parked at the little parking places they have there for people to come in for service. 30 minutes the next day, it's all fixed. That was 155 bucks. I didn't mind. So it's like everything's $155. I feel like <laughs> Rain Man. About 100 bucks, about $300. <laughs> I, you know. and, and it's maintenance units. Of course, the difference in boats and RVs and airplanes is a maintenance unit in an airplane is $1,000 an hour. Yeah. And they're not quite so bad with boats and RVs, but they're getting there. Yeah, exactly. And and there's, you know, there's a minimums to it. But would I recommend it to other people? Absolutely. The first thing I'd say, that was find out if you like it. Rent one. Whatever it costs to rent one, it's worth it. Because mm. it will save you money in the long run. It'll tell you the things you need, the things you don't, and let you know if you have the disposition for it or not. Not Mr. Impulse Buyer. I go get something. <laughs> you know, I'll figure it out later. I figured out later I screwed up. 
Do as I say, not as I do. As I do. Here's, here's, you know, here's my experience that will save you money. Yeah. And maybe wear and tear at home. You can bank some uh, some husband points if you show some common sense on this. <laughs> and if the family loves it, it's awesome. There is nothing, Brent, as you know, better than getting out in the woods, getting away from people. Now, I'm not talking about going to the campground where you're parked, you know, cheek to jowl with yeah. the next RV and it looks like it could eat yours. <laughs> so you now you've not only got, you know, crowded, noisy conditions, you have a little envy of the one that's parked next to you that has yeah. the fireplace, that has the washer dryer and all the, and you've yeah. got a 24 footer. Yeah. But to get out and actually go to sleep at night, hear quiet, look out and see stars, wake up in the morning, you see the woods wake up around you. It's, there's nothing like it. Yep. It's, you know, it's a way to get out in the outdoors and really do the outdoors. And then it opens places to you. You couldn't do. And I, let me tell you what beats the hell out of a tent. <laughs> I used to be a tent camper and I got to tell you, I'm not a tent camper. Anymore. Yeah. I, I don't think I've told the story before, but I took my son backpacking down in Tennessee and we climbed to the top of a mountain and it just unleashed one of those, you know, Florida style frog drowning rains. And we, we got the tent up with only moderate wetness and damage. And it was a small tent, you know, we're backpacking and we get in and we lay down on our, on our sleeping bags. And my son turns to me and goes, what do we do now, Dad? I said, this is it. Sweet. We survive. This is, this is as good as it gets. <laughs> exactly. And then the lightning starts. <laughs> and, and it did, yeah. And surprisingly, <laughs> yeah. he's not asked to go backpacking ever again, and that was 15 years ago. So, Well, that was probably a trip well worth taking. Yeah, exactly. Now, we've, we like to talk about guns, and we like the gun, the firearms industry and everything. Here's something I can talk about with a little bit of knowledge to people who – or gun people and want to do something like this, you still have to be responsible for your firearms. One of the best things I did when I bought mine was to locate a place that I could bolt a gun safe. Ah, excellent a idea. A gun safely. Yeah. Not, you know, hey, I hid it under the mattress, <laughs> which is the same place they look when they're stealing your wallet, your camera, exactly. and your computer. Yeah. And uh, the lock on an RV is not even as good as the lock on a Yugo. And, of course, with a Yugo or a smart car, you just pick it up and shake what you want out of it. <laughs> but, but um, I, you know, I went and got a, a flat pack that would hold a, a compact rifle mm -hmm. and a handgun, had them drill and bolt it to the floor in a secret location. And I just felt better about that. And, you know, you, if your gun's not on your person, it needs to be secured. And if it's on your person, please don't carry it in your pocket. When you blow your leg off, I'm going to feel <laughs> so not sorry for you. Oh. I, you know, there's, there's responsible and then there's responsibility. And if you don't show one, you get the other. Good point. And, you know, at the trip I took to South Dakota was fun because it was a wacky mix of industry people. We all happen to be people who like to ride motorcycles, and we all happen to be people that like to shoot guns. So we go out to South Dakota to the Black Hills. What do we do? Half a day we ride motorcycles. The other half a day we shoot guns. What's not to love about this picture? Other than the fact it was 104 degrees. Wow. <laughs> and South Dakota ain't built for that kind no. of heat. And, of course, I bounced my bike off a of buffalo, but that's another story. <laughs> buffalo always has right-of-way. Yeah, they're bigger than minivans, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this one was bigger than maxi vans. Wow. Crazy. And I bounced off of them and uh, went down the road, and the adrenaline rush hit, and I put my foot down and promptly fell over. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, but yeah, you know, the, the kind of things that you that you experience when you're out are what you're looking for. You're building memories yep. and even the the unpleasant things at the time build pleasant anthologies of memory as you go along. They become the memories that you really enjoy, like like you and your son. You may never go backpacking again, but you'll never forget that trip. Absolutely.
And that's, you know, that's a common ground thing that you'll never forget. Like, do you remember? Yes, unfortunately, I do. <laughs> I can't tell you what I had for breakfast this morning, but I remember that thing we did in second grade. Yep. Yep. And and that that's what you're doing. You're building memories and and you have the chance to go out and actually be with people. And I know the the RV industry does all these wonderful commercials where you see all these delightfully happy people out gathered around a campfire. Their marshmallows are perfectly cooked. Their s'mores look amazing. <laughs> Mine had it looked like it had been cremated. As it was a, it was a marshmallow. My s'mores were all schmutzy because I dropped it sticky side down, but I was still going to eat the damn thing. <laughs> I got chocolate all over my face. It was awesome. It, you know, it just wasn't. Uh, it just wasn't the way it's per- it's never the way it looks. We don't look like the people in the commercials. Yeah. On a good day, we don't look like them. Camping, we're bug bit, we're sunburned, we're wind blown, we're tired, we're cranky, we're irritable, which is why we wind. <laughs> but you keep going back, don't you? Yeah. And if you're gonna do this, the best advice I can give anybody, some of the best advice, is Don't think of the 14-hour Grand Prix trip you took from Lebanon, Kentucky to Daytona Beach, Florida as a child, where you never stopped unless it was either let off fluids or take on fuel. It doesn't work that way. You can't drive or tow a big vehicle if you're exhausted. There's a reason there are federal laws for the truck drivers. It's because those things can get away from you. And if your attention slips, they don't come back off the shoulder like like your car does. If you kind of drift off the edge, you've got to think about coming back up on the highway. Are you going to think about, uh uh-oh, rollover? Yeah. And I've seen enough of them do ugly things. To, to know that you just have to pay attention. So when you go out, don't map 37 states in, in 12 days. You ain't going to make, you know, have a, have a realistic time. Like my limit is I will drive six hours, period. However far I go in six hours, that's my day. If I'm driving 60 miles an, an hour average, I'm going to go about 350 miles. So that's why it took me three days to get to South Dakota because I didn't want to arrive either dead or exhausted. Yeah. And, and it turned out to be a pleasant trip in both directions. Now, I drove a little further coming back because I wanted the hell out of that camper. I'd been in there <laughs> long enough. And there is that. There is the, yeah. the abandonment. It's like I can't stand any more time in this little box, yeah. even by myself. I'm tired of me. Let me out of here. <laughs> Well, you got to go home to do that. Yep. Well, I, I think that's a great ending point here. And I, I've got to say, I can't let my wife listen to this podcast because I was laughing the whole time you were giving that advice. And it's great advice, says the host, who tends to take his boat to Florida and do that. Oh, 22 hours. I can do that in one fell no swoop. I can do that. Yeah, for those folks that have traveled in uh, Tennessee, the Mont Eagle downgrade, when I had my boat try to pass me in a rainstorm, you know, that that tends to get your attention. So uh, Yeah, if you if you make it to Chattanooga, there's only one giant curve you have to negotiate before you hit the road to Florida. Exactly. Oh, I, know, I know Mont Eagle. I live right off I-24. Yeah. Yeah, Mont Eagle will separate the beginners from the professionals. Exactly. So you see the beginners... They're in that left lane going boogity. Yeah. The people who have done it before got their flashers on. They're in the climbing lane because they don't want to eat the bumper of the of the freight liner that's coming up behind them. Exactly. Well, Jim, I appreciate all the insight and the ideas and the great tips for RV living. And again, even though this isn't necessarily a uh, gun-specific type topic, I think a lot of our audience really is either part of that group or they're strongly considering it like and and believe it or not you've still not talked me out of it so we (laughs) we may meet up one of these days in a campground there you go well (laughs) thanks again jim and uh we will talk sometime in the future you got it As always, Jim Shepard gave us some great advice and interesting opinions about the RV lifestyle, so hopefully you can make a more informed decision 
if you're considering also becoming an RV owner. If you found this episode interesting, you can also check out episode number 76, titled Wayne LaPierre Must Go. That's when I talked to Jim Shepard about his thoughts regarding the National Rifle Association. Unfortunately, looking back, things haven't changed much. Another travel-related episode you might enjoy is number 128, where I talked to Ken Campbell about flying with firearms. If there's a topic you want to hear, someone you'd like us to interview, or you want to share your thoughts about things, please drop me a line at editor at gunsmagazine.com. As always, you can find us on your favorite podcast directory, YouTube, and at gunsmagazine.com. I'd also like to remind you to subscribe so you don't miss out on any of our great episodes. And while you're online, don't forget to check out our great sister publications, American Handgunner Magazine at AmericanHandgunner.com, AmericanCop.com, and our numerous special editions available for sale on our websites and at Amazon. Right now, the hot ticket is the DIY Guns Home Gunsmithing Projects, number 30. Well, that's it for this episode of the Guns Magazine podcast. For the entire staff at FMG Publications, I'm Guns Magazine editor Brent Wheat. Now get out there and get shooting. Shooting.